It's ICHE8R1, the draft document that was released in May 2019 that we're going to be discussing today, and the impact it's going to have on sponsors and CROs. So I'd first of all take you through why I can speak with you on this topic. If I can find my arrow, that's, there it is. So what is my experience? I, I, I actually started working almost 50 years ago, and I worked in the oil industry, first of all, before more, I went to the NHS in 1979 and spent some five years in the National Health Service before going to Boehringer. Ingelheim, which I was with them for 32 years. My last part of my time with Boehringer Ingelheim, I was seconded to Transcelerate, uh, the industry body, and I worked on risk-based monitoring, quality tolerance limits, data transparency initiatives, e-source, and a number of others. And for the past five years, I've been doing consultancy, covering companies large to small. My background is maths and geology, uh, but I've spent the last 37 years, no, 42 years in the medical area. So what companies have I worked for? Uh, this gives you an idea of what I do for most companies, either ICH and E6 gap analyses about what they should be doing, or E8 doing action plans, lots of training, help with SOP revision, and not all of them restrict me in their CDAs to not mentioning their name. Hence, there are some names of companies down there. What I'm going to cover is describe the ICHE8 changes, explain the impact that's going to have on clinical trial conduct and also clinical development, and the opportunities for implementing it in your organization. Because I, I really do feel that it's very beneficial to organizations. So the agenda, first of all, I'm going to spend about 30 minutes on the regulatory path, where we've been and where we're going to, then a more detailed examination on ICHE8, and then how to address those gaps as module three. And that should leave us hopefully 25 to 30 minutes for discussion. And there should be a lot to discuss because it is bringing some really innovative ideas to the table, not least quality by design. Okay, so let's go on to module one. And this is about the regulatory path. Now, I do steal lots of slides. I am a thief by nature. I steal slides from the regulatory bodies, and this is one of their slides. This is from the EMA, and what they think we do. They believe we do testing in quality, that precarious ladder tied up with tape and, and string, and they want quality by design. There's a good quote from one of the German regulators who said she wants quality by design and not quality by accident. And what they mean by this is quite often they get, come into companies and look at the processes that we have and one team does it well and another team does it badly. And if we're running into the same SOP, that shouldn't be the case. There shouldn't be that variation. And that, I, I have viewed over 1,500 SOPs in the past five years when doing gap analyses, and I can tell you our SOPs are, and processes are that rickety ladder on the back of a truck. They're not robust quality by design. So I'm basically a statistician by training but I've done virtually every task in clinical development and I'm happy to answer your questions on anything. Now, how I, how I came to really following ICH in depth, I, I used to always ha hate the ICH GCP trainings that we used to get at work. I forgot how many times I made up the excuse that my dog had died 
or all sorts of relatives had, had dropped down dead just so I didn't have to go to them. But I changed my mind. I, I was invited to the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative meeting, that's CTTI, back in August 2011. And this is where the regulators were rolling out the EMA, FDA, and MHRA, that's the UK authority, MHRA, rolling out their risk-based monitoring. And I was invited as an industry representative because they'd seen what I was already doing. That was way back in 2010, we were doing this risk-based monitoring and that they wanted really to show the regulators, other regulators, what was possible. So at this meeting, there were concerns over quality from the regulatory authorities. They didn't trust the statements we had in our submissions. It, you may not be aware of what happens in a submission, but they're asked to make a statement about ICHGCP in each submission. And the way it's normally done is a company or a sponsor will say, we have conducted 30 audits, and from this, we derive that all the studies will run to ICH GCP. And if I ask you, in all honesty, you'd all say, well, none of our studies are fully run to ICH GCP. Something like 95 to 99% of audits have GCP findings. So how can we derive from that that all our studies are run to ICH GCP? And they know that if they select two sites, which they, they, they do virtually at random, they will always find GCP findings. 